Hello, this is Stuart. Welcome to Making Biocinematics, a behind the scenes look at this video about designing nanotechnology, specifically this nanoscale fabric that scientists have woven together out of individual molecules. If you haven't watched the whole video, feel free to go ahead and do that. You can click the link up here or down in the description. It's on the main Biocinematics channel, which hopefully you're subscribed to. If you're not, I would greatly appreciate you considering that. In this behind the scenes, I'm going to be showing how I turned some raw data points into these animated scenes. So this isn't going to be a tutorial, but hopefully we'll shed a little light on the hundreds of hours that went into this video in a fun, accessible way. As always, I welcome feedback in the comments on the format of these videos, or you can give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But if you are looking for 3D animation tutorials, you are in luck because I will be creating a tutorial mini series to show you step by step how to create the carbon nanotubes in these first scenes of this video. This will be for anyone who's familiar with some 3D tools like Blender, Maya, Cinema 4D, that sort of thing, but who's curious and interested in dipping their toes into Houdini, which is my tool of choice. So if you're curious about that, stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed here to Making Biocinematics with the bell notification on so you'll get notified when that goes up. You can always unsubscribe later and it's free. So nothing to lose. All right, getting into the meat of the behind the scenes. Big picture, I wanted to talk a bit about how the story came to be and how it fits into this hypothetical new series I'm calling Real Research. So the idea here is to talk about research, that is the process of science in the context of some cool new research paper. So at its heart, this video is just as much about how scientists get to a result as it is about the result itself. So how did I end up with fabric nanotech? Well, I was approached by a research group for which I've created animations and other visuals for in the past. Professor David Lee sent me this paper and asked if I could create some short animation clips showing how the fabric assembled and various tests that they performed to analyze this molecular structure. So I did that, and generally speaking in the video, these are the ones that you see with the blue background. Those are some of the clips that I created. And I realized that this would be a good candidate for my real research series. So I asked if I could integrate the clips into a video of my own, and Dave Lee was on board with that, which is fantastic. So I had to decide what kind of narrative made sense to weave around this research. Again, I'm less interested in making a kind of press release or the kind of science journalism you often see. There's nothing necessarily wrong with those formats. I just want to come from a different angle and consider what kind of insight we can get into the research process itself. So I decided to talk about the idea of incremental progress, building complexity over time, um, and also serendipity and how you don't always know where a path is going to lead. And obviously, because this is a biology channel, I had to tie it into molecular biology, which I think is valid. I, I don't think I was just trying to wedge it in. Um, it's maybe a little bit more peripheral to the core topics and ideas, but I think it's an important thing to think about in the context of nanotechnology, how biochemistry is really the original nanotechnology, if you will. And then the later section asking about the practical applications. My feeling is that this is an obvious question that gets asked a lot. How, what can you, what can you use it for? What is it? What can you do with it? Where, how is it going to be useful in our day-to-day -day lives? People write that kind of thing into grants. That's the focus of a lot of press releases. Um, but I really wanted to consider the idea that a lot of even Nobel prize winning research in a lot of cases, the researchers, they might have had some idea of possibilities, but you, you never really know where something is going to lead to or what it's going to become useful for. And also the idea that that's maybe not the most important question to consider um, when exploring new research. So those were the, th the main threads of the story that I was trying to weave together, weave together, haha, <laughs> uh, into this narrative talking about serendipity and progressive complexity and biochemistry and how we think about the applications of research. Okay, let's move on to some of the design choices that I had to make in this video. I had about 40 shots to create for this video, including the ones that I had created earlier in the year, the, the standalone animation clips. 
but I needed everything to hang together in style, but I also needed to distinguish a few different things. There are four or five different settings that I wanted to show, and I wanted to make each of them visually distinct. So I'll explain what I mean about settings. First, there's what's happening in vitro in glass, in the chemistry lab. Those are the ones that we see with the blue background. I was trying to convey the feeling of this aqueous environment in some kind of solution. And a lot of it has the simplified cartoonish representation, just primarily due to the visual and the technical complexity. So stripping out a lot of the detail and just focusing on how the grids are connected together. Secondly, there's in vivo, in the body, and I wanted to use a parallel, the, the same molecular representation and visual style, but we're just changing the background to this organic pinky red to show that this is not happening in the same place. So these two are more visually photorealistic. They've got depth of field and they've got things moving to show that they're actual chemical processes. They're really happening uh, in the real world. Then I wanted to show a slightly more conceptual setting, which is where I talk more about the abstract ideas of the design process and the history. So here we have a different visual style. It uses a similar molecular representation, which I think shows the structural arrangement of these molecules best. And I'm also supporting that with a more simplified topology to really get across the idea of these knots and these loops that are connected together and going over and under and around and the different crossings that these knots have. Obviously there are also some sections with text and stick figures and I thought it made sense to use the same background as the structural showcase. So this is kind of abstract land, it's not happening in the real world. And finally we have something that I'm calling hypothetical land, which involves molecules, kind of, but it's not real. So the loom is an example, the self-weaving molecules, these are imaginary and they're just trying to demonstrate an idea. And then there are the applications, can it be used as a bandage or is it bulletproof or am I imagining that maybe it could be used as an adhesive? So those don't exist and sometimes they represent something impossible. So I wanted to show those structures almost schematically. Originally I was thinking of kind of a tune rendering cell shaded with sort of inked outlines and flat colors. To be honest, I kind of ran out of time for that. So I settled on a very sort of flat diffuse look with simple colors. I don't know how successful or consistent this is or if it gets across the idea that this is a separate conceptual space Again, this is none of it is real, but I'm trying to use different visual styles to support the idea that we're discussing these molecules in different ways. One is showing the real chemical processes, how things come together. One is showing a hypothetical what could be or questions about something. And one is just kind of showing something in a very straightforward, presenting just the structure. We're just talking about just how these things look and not how they behave and how they move. Okay, I thought it might be interesting to take a look at how I created a complete shot from beginning to end, from the research paper to final renders. So this was a fairly simple shot here. This is showing the catenane formation. I don't think I used the word catenane in the final video, but two rings linked together. That's what a catenane is. This is, this is from research many years ago. So I found the original paper and this figure is showing very simply and schematically the steps in this chemical process. Okay, so the next thing I needed to do was get some actual structural data, some 3D coordinates for the atoms that represent this molecule. For that, I went to the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, the CCDC website. Now, if this was a larger macromolecule like a protein, then I would go to the protein data bank, the RCSB protein data bank. But for smaller molecules, this is the place that I go. Basically, I just searched for the author's name and I found a variety of structures here and I basically went through and found the one that was closest to the molecule that I wanted. And this is basically the one that I selected. It's very, very close, if not identical to the one in the paper. The nickel might be in copper in the paper or something like that, but it's, it's basically the same thing. So I downloaded this data file 
converted it to a format that Houdini would read. And here we are in Houdini. So I've imported this. It's the same structure. Um, and these are all of the atoms. Then what I wanted to do was actually get rid of some of the additional stuff split out the ions and I wanted to get three components to animate. So we've got the, the one loop and then we've got the two halves of the other loop. So that's the, that's the loop. There's one half of it. And here's the other half of it that's coming in. Uh, and this is just keyframe animation. It's very simple and not complicated motion. I thought about doing more complicated motion. You'll notice that in the animation, everything is fairly rigid. I think it's important to show the flexibility in the structure. In this case, partly mostly due to time constraints. I just had to do this very quickly and simply, but if I really wanted to do it the, in an ideal way, I would have some flexing a, across the bonds and have the, the strands, you know, kind of moving around uh, as they come together. So animating the, the various things to come together. So you can see that, boop, they kind of come around. So the, the ion comes in, yay. Here we go. There's the final representation. What you can do is I could set up this geometry, these sticks before I animate them. But what I actually ended up doing is just using simple rules to determine where the sticks should go. So that if I move this across the other parts of the molecule, you can see these sticks forming because everything's getting too close. And there's two reasons for that. One is that so I don't actually have to animate the sticks disappearing and forming as the bonds form um, when the molecules are coming together. The other reason is that as I'm animating this, especially this guy coming in, I want to make sure that the positioning of this part of it, which one is it? Is it this one? Is such that I'm not getting too close to the other atoms, um, which would be chemically bad. <laughs> You'd have atoms intersecting and that's not cool. So that's part of the reason why I have these sticks being formed. It's kind of a little visual check for me and be like, ah, this getting too close to there, sort of have it slide in and around that just sort of shimmy into place. And then basically I just need to render it out. I've just got some simple materials that make it look kind of shiny. I've got some lights. All right, and that's what the render looks like here. I have this sort of uh, blue fog um, as things get farther away from the camera, which is less important in this scene, but in other scenes where you have stuff distant, I wanted that kind of that light fall off as things kind of get hazy into the background. So then once I've rendered all of that out, I take it into my compositing application here. So this is basically what I get out of my render. Uh, no background, um, just the, the raw stuff. I do a little bit of color correction here. Then I put a background behind it so that it looks nice and integrated into its environment. Um, add a little bit of depth of field. Here it's very, very subtle because most of the stuff is in the plane of the camera. But in, again, in other scenes where you have stuff in the background, I wanted those to be kind of diffuse and out of focus and, and really highlight this stuff in the foreground. A little bit of final color correction and motion blur on that guy. And yeah, that's basically the final shot. So there you go, starting from uh, a research paper figure, collecting the data, importing it, animating it, adding color, lights, compositing it all together, and then putting it into the final video. So that was one of about 40, like I said. All right, let's talk about another fun thing. This is probably the most complicated aspect of the whole production. And that is the, these flexible tails on the grid units. Not everything was hand animated. Uh, the grid units, for the most part, they're static and that's great. And that's part of the reason why I had, have them as the, this cartoony simplification so I don't have to worry about little jiggling and everything like that. Although in reality, they would be jiggling a little bit and moving around, especially after the ions. But I did want to show that these flexible tails are flexing and they're 
interacting with each other. And especially as the grin units come in, they have to somehow snap together. But the base, the, the sort of the core of these grids themselves, that's, that's hand animated. Um, but all of these little tails on them, what I ended up doing is creating a small subset of tails and simulating using a wire simulation. Well, I can dive into, it's like, this is just going to explode, which is always hilarious. Um, but you can see that the tails here are just individual little curves and boom, off they go. These two didn't explode because they haven't uh, gotten stuck together yet, I think. But the idea was that I just created a small subset of these tails. I simulated them wiggling around for a bit with some turbulent air sort of forces and just mapped those onto the grid units that needed them. Here we have, I mean, they all get 12, three times four tails, uh, but these tails are stuck together. So I had to simulate them being, uh, uh, constrained together as though they're, you know, my fingers on camera stuck together so that they, as they move it around, they weren't like separating easier said than done, but I managed to do that. So with these guys, these are a special case because these have to start separate and then come together and snap together with a nice little popping sound effects added in later. Uh, if you are clever in some of these scenarios, what you can actually do is you can start with things connected and then have them break apart and then flip the footage around or flip the simulation around so that it appears as though they're starting, uh, starting separate and then joining themselves together. I didn't actually do that in this case. Um, and part of the reason is that sometimes it can get really hard to manage because you have the simulation going in reverse, but you have the keyframe animation going forwards. And so you have to figure out the timing of like, if I flip this around, then I'm going to map this so that it starts here. Yeah, I haven't seen Tenet, but I can imagine that this is uh, the kind of thing that Christopher Nolan is having to figure out in his head, uh, reversing time in various ways as time is moving forward and backwards. Anyways, what I ended up doing was creating these special constraints that would turn on at a specific point in time uh, so that the tails would, would snap together. I think it ended up working out okay. Except for the fact that for every single other shot, I had to think about whether I was gonna have the tails moving. Um, and in some shots, that's actually, uh, was gonna be a very challenging thing to do. So if you look carefully in the video, um, you may notice that in some shots, everything, all the tails are wiggling and in some shots, things are pretty static. And that's kind of just an unfortunate inconsistency that I had to live with. All right. Another cool simulation. So in the video, we have the spaghetti version and the spaghetti version is not woven together in these nice grids, but it's just kind of a free for all collection of strands. So I had to think of a way to tangle these curves together. And the best way that I thought was just essentially take a bunch of spaghetti and drop it on the floor. Uh, and that's what I'm doing here. So I've got a bunch of uh, individual strands, but if I add some turbulence to them, you can see that they're already kind of changing shape. And I just basically drop them on the floor. Splat. I can sort of go in and map the individual molecular structures onto those curves. If I can get in close enough without the camera clipping it, um, you, can, you can see that I've got these individual strands of this molecular structure along each of those curves. The biggest challenge for this one was that you need a lot of them. So that's not nearly enough. What I had to do is basically simulate, I can't even remember how many hundreds, especially at the end of the video where I'm showing the, the ion net experiment. Uh, this was really key. So I've got the grid units um, as, as one part of the experiment and I've got this tangled spaghetti version as the counterpart and the ions have to be able to n move through and navigate through this dense network of, of tangled spaghetti. So I wanted the holes to be appropriately spaced so that um, it was a plausible kind of mesh size. So that just took, took a long time to simulate all of the spaghetti smashing down. This is probably going to totally mess with YouTube compression if I just 
orbit around here. Yeah, I can see my hear my graphics card fan spinning up already. I really like visual complexity, but YouTube doesn't. So thank you for joining me. I hope you learned a few interesting tidbits. If you want to continue supporting Biocinematics, watching my videos, fantastic. If you're not yet subscribed to Biocinematics or Making Biocinematics, again, it's free and it really helps a lot. Uh, you'll be notified when new videos come out. So stay tuned for the Carbon Nanotube Houdini tutorial if you're interested in doing your own science visualization. I think that'll be a lot of fun. If you want to support the channel more directly, there's a Patreon, patreon.com slash biocinematics, and it would be tremendously appreciated if you could even consider a dollar per video or something like that. Um, and there's lots of perks and rewards that you can check out, patreon.com slash biocinematics. So thanks again for watching. Um, I'm Stuart, and this is Biocinematics.